So I would like to welcome folks as they join to our Open Ireland Network event here in November. Uh, we are hoping today to go through some really interesting research and make it available to everyone offline afterwards. Um, I would like to, first of all, make an, a really great welcome to Colin Eberhardt, who is joining us as one of the authors of the Linux Foundation Europe's um, Open Source Report for Europe. Um, I probably got the title wrong, but you can correct me after the fact, <laughs> Colin. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to Klaus Jan Stahl, who was uh, the co-author of the ICT Skillnet um, report on open source and inner source skills in Ireland. And we will be covering that report just a little while later in our call. Um, but in the meantime, and to start us off, um, to get that broader picture, I'm going to invite Colin uh, now to, to hopefully be able to share his screen without issue and, and take us through a summary of um, that wonderful report that came out in September from Linux Foundation Europe to hear more about what's happening at the regional level. Sure, I'd be happy to. I'll just check I'm sharing the right screen. So hopefully you should be able to see my screen. A thumbs up would be much appreciated. We'll let oh, you know. What to do. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. All good. Take it away, Colin. Great. OK, well, my name is Colin Eberhardt. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the state of open source in Europe. But ahead of that, I want to, to very briefly introduce myself and the company that I work for, in case you haven't heard of us, which is, is quite likely. So my name is Colin Eberhardt. I'm the CTO at a software consultancy called Scott Logic. And a very brief bit of background. We were founded in 2005. Uh, according to this slide, we're around about 350. We're more like 400 people now, uh, distributed across a number of offices, mostly within the UK. We're a software consultancy, and we we tend to specialize in, in consultancy within financial services, but we've also had a growing number of projects within public sector. So we, we, we generally speaking, um, take on sort of quite challenging technology projects, things like trading platforms, risk systems, that sort of thing. And as I mentioned, um, I'm the CTO. And open source is interesting to me in that it spans both my professional interests and my personal interests. So I've, I've been contributing to open source for around about 20 years now in various different ways. And for me, it's great to be able to, to find something which is a useful uh, and, and viable intersection of both my professional and personal time. So. Uh, Talking about open source, the thing that I find quite interesting about open source is that it, it means different things to different people. Uh, for some people, it's a, a way of working. For others, it's a, a business model. For others, it's a, a phenomenon or, or a, a community. And, and I guess, it, in my opinion, it's, it's actually all of these things. And that's what makes open source really quite interesting. In, in simple terms, it's about sharing of code in public often with a highly permissive license but as i said it's it's a great many more things to many different people although i think the one thing that we can almost all agree on uh, regardless of your ex your perspective is that open source is really quite ubiquitous uh, recent reports from various different um, uh, research bodies that indicate that somewhere between 70 to 90 percent of of the software within the products that we use is now open source. So it really is quite ubiquitous. So that gets me onto the, the report that I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about. Uh, it's it, one of the interesting things with digital technology is that, that our cultural values shape our attitudes, attitudes, perspectives and approaches. And that's why we wanted to look at Europe in isolation. We wanted to have a look at how the different cultural values of the countries that make up Europe influence our, our perspectives on open source. So this came about as a collaboration between ourselves, so Scott Logic and my colleagues, uh, Graham and Matt, uh, and Linux Foundation Research. We, we were invited to, to be the, the lead authors on this report. And the, the, the report was based on, on a couple of research activities. The first was a survey, which was completed by around about 1,500 individuals across Europe. And then, a number of interviews. I think we interviewed about 18 different people from uh, public sector, private sector, transportation, financial services, quite a broad cross section. And the findings I'm going to show you today are, uh, are the results of that research. So it's, you'll find a few opinions creeping in of, uh, along the way, but the, the, the basis of this is, is research work. 
So why why did we or why did I jump at the chance? I, I guess one of the things that I, I find really fascinating is that um, open source builds bridges between different circles. It, it creates interesting conversations. My my professional career has mostly been working within financial services. And uh, I'm really interested to find out um, about the opinions of people in sectors that I have no experience of myself and and whether we can find common ground through open source. And also to share one of the first findings we asked, uh, we asked through the survey, to what extent respondents perceive open source to be valuable to their sector? And 74% strongly agreed and some 16% somewhat agreed. So it, it's clear that open source is, is important to a great many people, regardless of the sector that they work within. So onto the findings themselves. One thing I'll point out here is that I'm just going to give you a bit of a teaser, uh, a bit of a flavour of the findings. This is this is not meant to be exhaustive. The report is around about 45 pages long and goes into a, a lot more detail. I'm just going to um, pull a few strands, follow a few stories through the report. If you've got any other questions, please do ask and yeah, I'm going to keep plugging it. Do Do download the report. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at consumption and contribution and hopefully you're familiar with these terms but I'll, I'll briefly explain so consumption is is the act of either directly using an open source product or tool or more often than not incorporating that product or project or library into your own code base incorporating it into the product that you distribute to your clients contribution is the act of effectively giving back. It's uh, it's the act of uh, of contributing code or or potentially contributing designs or or, or testing or or any other anything else that that creates value um, for the open source projects that you're currently using. I noticed we've got a question in the chat. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> you're saying yes. Please do uh, ask questions in the chat. So that's contribution and consumption. So let's start digging into some of the survey findings. So the first thing here is we asked um, we asked people to describe their the consumption policy of their employees. So on the of their employer. On the left hand side, you can see uh, the, the different answers that they gave. So one is uh, consumption is openly encouraged, or consumption is permitted under limited conditions, or no clear policy, or or we're not allowed to consume open source at all. Here we decided to present the findings based on the size of the organization that the individual worked within. So here we can see some interesting patterns emerge. Micro businesses, those with fewer than 10 uh, employees, are highly permissive and highly encouraging of open source consumption. So 80% report the use of open source is openly encouraged. And this is for, I guess, fairly obvious reasons. If you're a, a small company, there's tremendous value to be to be to be had by incorporating open source tooling. The larger the company, the more they place limiting conditions on consumption. So what we find as we move over to the right, that the largest companies, uh, it, it moves from consumption being openly encouraged to being permitted under limiting conditions. This I still think is a good result rather than moving to a position where consumption is no longer permitted. They simply have limiting conditions, which are required more often than not to safeguard their businesses. Interesting, and another interesting point here is the, the no clear policy line. We find that it's the mid-sized businesses, those with sort of 11 up to 10,000 employees are the, are the ones where there's a lack of policy clarity, whereas the largest businesses, clarity emerges once again. And I, I see clarity, I see these answers, the don't know, not sure, and no clear policy as opportunities this this is something that that with effort we can hopefully resolve some of these clarity issues when it comes to contribution things get i guess a little bit more interesting so here we're we're comparing contribution policies and now this time we're not comparing it to the uh, size of the organization we're comparing it to the industry sector so across the top we have a view on the contribution policy so on the left hand side we have the highly permissive contribution is openly encouraged Next, it's, it's uh, contribute if required by the license, then no clear policy, not permitted or don't know or not sure. What we can see here is those working within, within the IT industry, professional, scientific, telecommunications, 
uh, they have a predominantly um, uh, th th there's a predominant encouragement of contribution to open source. Um, this this is something where these are industries that that clearly understand the value of open source in a in a well-rounded sense, and they're encouraging their employees to give back. That that's a stark difference to public sector education, finance, and insurance. Now here, rather than uh, being in a situation where contributions are not permitted, interestingly, there's no clear policy at all. That the the for, for in some of these sectors, the majority of individuals just don't know whether they're allowed to contribute or not, which is um, quite an interesting finding. If we move to the next slide, uh, again, slicing the data, yet another way, looking at it from a country perspective. Here, we're looking at how the perceived importance of open source flows down to consumption and then contribution. So on the left-hand side, we ask the question, how important is open source to the sector that you work within? Here, you can see that you know, a significant number indicate that it's important to their sector. However, we see differences from one country to another. Um, Spain is at the, at the lower end of the spectrum, whereas Germany and the Netherlands are at the higher end of the spectrum. People within those countries tend to, to see a greater importance to open source. This then trickles down into the, the consumption policy and then trickles down into the contribution policy. And it, uh, Almost as expected, uh, consumption uh, is 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 slightly less encouraged than than perceived importance. Contribution slightly less encouraged than than consumption. But again, we we see certain countries that are outliers. Again, Spain is something of an outlier. There's something going on here. We we have not been able to explain the data, but we can see uh, an interesting correlation here. There's also other other interesting factors. Um, looking at consumption versus contribution, uh, that 20% report a lack of clear consumption policy, whereas 43% report a lack of clear contribution policy. So contribution itself becomes more challenging. Also, something else that we did, which isn't shown here, we, we found a, a direct correl correlation between the contribution policy and activity on GitHub. We can actually see um, countries where they have a more encouraging contribution policy are more active on GitHub. It's, it's quite interesting to see that correlation. So that leads us to the conclusion that, that we feel that we need to address the imbalance between consumption and contribution through clear policy. Um, I, I think there's a there's growing understanding in the, in the industry that we have a sustainability challenge here and that we do need to increase contribution. And our research uh, was able to shine a light on the imbalance between consumption and contribution. And notably, this gap is wider in some sectors, telecommunic telecommunication, public sector, finance and insurance. In those sectors, we feel that we need to address this imbalance with, with greater urgency. Moving on, we'll have a look at open source leadership. This was a strong theme that emerged within our within our survey findings. So I guess open source leadership, you may or may not have heard of the concept of an open source program office or OSPO. It's it's a it's a, a concept that's that's growing in popularity. So an OSPO is a, a sort of cross-functional team embedded within an organization that helps define enable and, and ensure the adoption of open source strategy and, and policy. And here you can see one of the people we interviewed did, uh, interviewed pointed out that a, a, a central role of, of the OSPO is to fundamentally relate the value of open source to the business as a whole, and notably not just to the, to the technical folk via the CTO, it's the CFO and the rest of the C-suite. What our data showed is that there are, it, there's, significant improvements in various aspects of open source where an organization has an OSPO or, or, or a visible leader of some form. And we'll show you some of these results now. So here we, we're looking at the consumption policy. Um, on, looking at the, we segmented the data based on whether the, the respondent indicated that they have an OSPO or a clear and visible leader on open source strategy. So we acknowledge that an OSPO is not the only way to create open source leadership. Here we can see a significant difference in the consumption policies uh, at those organizations. If in the presence of an OSPO, a clear and visible leader, 74% of people re reported that consumption is openly encouraged compared to just 49% in the absence of this leadership. And again, notably, there's 
uh, a much greater clarity at organizations with um, open source program offices or, or clear leadership. So again, a, a really good uh, illustration of, of the value of open source leadership. And another question we asked is, is the value that, they, that the organization derives from open source and whether that is increasing or decreasing uh, this year versus last year. And here we can see that, again, for those who work in an organization with an OSPO or leader, the value they derive from open source has increased significantly, 64% report that, versus only 39% um, reporting an increased value through open source. So again, uh, a, a very good reason to, to consider uh, open source leadership in, in some form. So this leads us to the conclusion previously that we, we mentioned that, uh, that we need to close the gap between consumption and contribution and policy is key to closing that gap. We're now stating that you need to create this clarity, the, the clear policies through leadership. And, and clearly, open source program offices are, are, a, are a viable route to doing that for some organizations. Finally, I want to take a slightly different angle. Uh, we, throughout our survey, we did notice differences, deviations throughout various different industry sectors. However, I want to pick on one uh, specifically because it was really quite noteworthy. Public sector was an outlier in almost every single question that we asked within this survey. And more often than not, it was, was an outlier in, in, I'd say, a negative way. It wasn't an outlier in a, in a positive way. And I think that's something that we, we um, felt the need to drill into. So uh, the public sector has an interesting relationship with open source. Um, it's increasingly being uh, formally prescribed by various national and international governing bodies across Europe. The, the European Commission in its open source uh, software strategy that it published um, uh, relatively recently, it puts a special emphasis on the sharing and the reuse of software solutions, knowledge and expertise, as well as on the in increasing the use of open source in information technologies and other strategic areas. In the United Kingdom, uh, public sector digital standards assurance assurance process uh, mandates that project plans show how the use of open source has been considered. And there are, there are similar organizations within Germany and Italy, which are, are, are effectively prescribing uh, some form of usage or consideration of open source within the public sector. So there's, there's a, a growing mandate within public sector that open source should be used or at least considered ahead of, of um, or vendor or proprietary or closed source solutions. But that's not exactly playing out in practice. Uh, getting back to our, our contribution policy question, which we've already seen, uh, public sector uh, really is suffering from a lack of clar uh, clarity in, in policies. And we see this in contribution policy, we're seeing this in consumption policy as well. It, it is a significant outlier. So whilst there is a, there is a mandate, uh, it's, it's not turning into policies which are visible to those which are the decision makers on the ground. Also, it's, it's a significant outlier in other aspects which we touched on in the report. Um, hopefully people on this call are familiar with the concept of inner source. It's the idea of um, having a slightly more open approach to the projects within your own organization, allowing uh, people to uh, contribute to projects which are, are not their immediate concern. So for example, maybe having shared components or shared infrastructure that everyone could contribute to. Within the public sector, only 37% of people spend time contributing to projects that are managed by other teams compared with an industry-wide average of 54%. So public sector is notably behind in, in adopting inner source practices. Now, it was interesting to start considering possibly some of the reasons behind this. Uh, we, we explored the motives and motivations that people had for, for um, embracing open source. So we, we asked them, you know, what are the benefits that open source gives to the particular sector that you work within. So you can see the sectors um, are, are the columns going left to right, and the potential motivations are on the left-hand side. There are the rows on this table, and, and the color coding is effectively the strength of sentiment. So you can see that um, a great many 
people working in, in various sectors indicate that industry standards and interoperability are a primary motivator and a primary benefit of open source. Um, so you can see a sort of green streak across the top. Innovation, again, this is the kind of stuff you'd expect. Uh, for many sectors, that's a strong motivator. However, public sector, which is the second column, uh, one thing that really jumps out here is transparency. 52% of people within public sector strongly indicate that transparency is a primary motivator for, for adopting open source, which is quite an outlier. Whilst other sectors are interested in innovation and industry standards, public sector are much more interested in transparency and also notably reducing operating costs. So to my mind, in order to fully unlock the value of open source, we need to understand how motivations differ within public sector and we need to create an environment that meets their sector specific needs this is part of the reason i feel that that open source has has the public sector has struggled to unlock the value in open source uh, and then again to just to quote uh, some of the people that we interviewed uh, effectively speaking from experience uh, uh, Joyce, uh, Joyce uh, from from uh, Central Digital and Data Office it said there's a cultural expectation within the UK public sector that you should entirely focus on the direct delivery of the projects in front of you. So no, no time or space is afforded for contribution to create support uh, or indirect value. So basically, this is a this is a cultural aspect uh, and a cultural challenge that, that we're experiencing, at least within the UK. So, yeah. Our feeling is, despite the publicly visible policies on consumption uh, and the increased number of public sector founded projects, we still find this sector to be an outlier in many aspects of our, our research. And, and we feel that as citizens, we have a vested interest in how public sector organisations spend our money and that public sector is very much in need of open source leadership to, to tackle these challenges. And open source leadership that's mindful to the different motives and the different challenges that exist within the public sector, which are the reasons behind it becoming an outlier. And it's not just us, it's not just the three of us that wrote this report that, that, that share this view. Uh, our respondents agreed. We, we asked which of the areas that, that people feel should receive um, open source of investment within Europe so we basically asked, you know, where should Europe invest? And government consumption of open source was the most frequently cited area of investment across Europe. And you can see public sector, 93%. It, it's quite obvious that people within public sector would want effectively more, uh, more investment in their own area. But those working in, in information technology, education, telecommunications, across the board, everyone said public sector, government consumption of open source is, is where we would like to see the most investment. Also, open source alternatives to technology monopolies. It was another sort of, uh, sort of loud and clear uh, sort of response from, from the people that we surveyed. So how do we, how do we actually get there? What, what might the future look like? And this is where I'm going to do just a little bit of future gazing. I guess taking a few steps back, uh, open source has come on, on quite a journey. In, in the very early stages, I guess pre-2000s, in, in the sort of 80s and 90s, I, I'd kind of call that the, the bearded hacker era. This, is, this was the era of, of Linux and Mozilla and the GNU project, where it was it was a small, close-knit community, effectively of hackers who, who discovered that this was a great way to build a lot of the technology foundations that we currently rely upon. Um, Linux, uh, a lot of the internet standards were, were constructed by these very, very small communities. It, it was from sort of the year 2000 onwards that that the rest of the software industry really started to wake up to, to open source. This is when, uh, for example, Linux Foundation appeared. It was, a, it was an era of commercialization of, of open source, uh, where, where companies were acknowledging that open source is, is, a, is a significant concern for businesses. And for some, it's fundamentally a business model. Uh, there, there are some interesting reports about the the value that open source has delivered commercially within the UK and Europe. And there are, there are uh, venture capitalists that specialize in open source software. And, and I, I personally think, you know, commercialization of, 
of of open source is is a good thing uh, having more more companies spend money on open source and and generate their own wealth through open source if done correctly can be very good and beneficial as a whole but i look at linux foundation i think where 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 are the where is public sector? Where are the governments? Where, where, where are they represented? They, they don't seem to have a seat at the table at the moment. At the moment, we, we're, in, we're in at the tail end of, of the commercialization of open source. Personally, I think we, we could be on the cusp of, of a, a third era of open source where we acknowledge the, the public good that, that open source can create. Um, the concept of the digital commons, uh, where we, we use the same kind of uh, language that we do our environmental commons. We, we see it as a thing that we should be protecting. And the government has a natural role as, uh, in protecting our environmental commons. And I think it has a role in protecting our digital commons as well. I think it, in the near future, we'll hopefully see uh, new uh, forums where people within public sector can get together and discuss their specific challenges around open source. And I think that will effectively create what may become the third era within, within uh, open source. And I think, you know, looking to the long term, I think the nature of open source technology and ways of working fundamentally means that it breaks down barriers. Uh, since the value that it creates is, is by design for all, it's it's an inherently neutral and spa safe space for, for collaboration. And I, I think we should be using these characteristics to, to foster non-commercial engagement and, and create relationships between experts, regardless of where they're built, uh, where they are based. So that's that's the, the sort of brief whistle-stop tour of our of our report. I would very much encourage you to, to download it. And I, I hope that's given you some useful food for thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, that was amazing. And uh, it was it was great to hear. I think there was even more details than I heard at the Linux Foundation event. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I also I, I know we had actually scheduled to go straight into the Irish report, but um, I have a couple of questions that I would, sure, I would go for it. to ask now. So I, I we're, we're just going to get flexible with the agenda now and, uh, and ask these questions um I, I did see one come through uh on the q a thing uh, from rakesh uh, who was who was asking about the proportion with open source program offices um i'm assuming that that came in before you actually presented that bit about the open source program office but rakesh if if, if you have a follow-on question or if, if it wasn't answered in the presentation please do elaborate in the q a or chat uh yeah to, to answer that question we did ask um ask individuals whether their employer had an open source program office or a clear and visible leader. So we have exa exactly that data. Um, we don't, I don't think we asked the organization that they worked for. So we, we, we're not correlating that directly to organizations. So we, we can just tell you the percentage of the population who work in an organization that has an open source program office. So I think that, I think that goes some way to answering your question. Yeah, no, thank thank you very much. Um, and uh, welcome back, Klaus. Klaus, feel free as well to to ask any questions that you, you may have. Uh, I, I'm going to, first of all, just start off by saying um, thank you as well for, for bringing us into the discussion around digital public goods and the idea that we can all collaborate better through open source. Um, I know I, I only discovered the digitalpublicgoods.net um, uh, organization relatively recently um, through the, the UN was pointing at that as being a place um, where folks could go and look at projects uh, and they're they're trying to support projects that have this idea of being an open source digital public good and adherence to privacy and they're, and they're trying to give them additional support so if ha people haven't seen that one it's a good one to also check out um but i'm gonna i, I the question i wanted to kind of get your input on yeah particular was was this idea of the imbalance between contribution and consumption and thinking about the value of open source I, i'm just gonna say you know to in my mind when we discuss the value of open source, a lot of times the value that we talk about is actually related to the consumption of open source, right? So, so yeah, actually, course, yeah. in many respects, you know, the 98% of the world's software contains open source, it's there for a reason. And, and I think that that may be better accepted now. But actually, as you were speaking, it dawned on me that I'm not sure I've seen quite as much explicitly on the value of contributing 
to open source. Um, so I'm going to ask you about that now, because maybe, I mean, I'm wondering, is that part of the imbalance that we, we hear a lot of the value related to the consumption, but not to the contribution? So I, I, I think you're entirely correct. Uh, and part, part of the reason is the value of consumption is is quite directly measurable and directly quantifiable. If if you're building an application that's going to be, I don't know, 100,000 lines of code and developers, I think they create 11 lines of code a day, or that could be some old mythical man month thing. But you, you can quantify the cost of developing software. And if you can get a component of that software for free, which means you have to build less yourself, you can quantify the value of that. So consumption of open source, you can put you know, pounds, dollars, pence, whatever currency you use, you, you can put a value on it contribution it's it's hard to to describe the value in such a simple sense describing the value is is it's a little bit more tricky because it's a little bit more complicated and there are various different routes in one, one is i think the one i'd like people to understand the most is is the more long term and it's the more you know we're part of a community because as i mentioned at the beginning um to some people open source is code, others it's community. And to me, it's all of those things. Open source only exists because there are communities behind it that, that create it. And uh, to sustain open source, someone ha people have to roll up their sleeves and, and pitch in. So you have to have quite a long-term uh, perspective to, to be able to say, okay, uh, we should be contributing to open source because this thing that we're consuming we should be part of the team that that maintain that for the long term so if if your goals are always going to be very short term if you only care about what happens this month next month or this year that argument is meaningless to you but if you care about what might happen in the next five years or ten years then you can build an argument for for contribution however there are also some potential short-term arguments and, and something that that emerged when when talking to some of the people that I interviewed, um, a, a lot of times when you're consuming open source uh, projects, there's there's an important component that's absent, and that's some form of support model. Uh, a lot of businesses are a little bit concerned about if I consume this open source code and it goes wrong, who's going to fix it for me? And my answer to them is, you guys, you should fix it. Um, to, to my mind, a good insurance policy when you're consuming open source code is to build up an element of expertise in, in that open source project in-house so that you can protect your own consumption, your own investment in that open source technology. And that will naturally lead you to contribute back. But to, to my mind, that's your insurance policy. It also means that with these open source projects, you start to get a seat at the table. It, you may use an open source project and their roadmap may drift away from the direction that you would like it, it, it to move in. The way to influence that roadmap is to become part of the team. So there are some more near-term and immediate reasons that, that you can, you can uh, give to, to contribution, but it's a challenge. Consumption's just easy. You can explain it to anyone that cares about money, you know? <laughs> And, and speaking about money, I, uh, you'll be glad to hear, um, because I, I didn't actually get to introduce myself for, for, for the folks online who may not may, may not uh, have, have met us before, but um, I, I work with Inner Source Commons and Klaus Jan Stahl as well has been, you know, researching Inner Source for many years. So when we heard you talk about that, I, there were at least all of us going, yay, <laughs> we're well believers in, in the Inner Source path. And it dawned me then when we're talking about this, because um, you, you, you were talking about the the value or being able to put a money value on on, on contributing back, and certainly we've heard um, at Inner Source Commons this idea of the constraints for contributing, even in Inner Source, being constrained by organizational policy that suggests if I'm if if you're not doing stuff that I'm responsible for, I'm not yeah. paying. Right, yeah. and and I wonder then in that context. Might that be even harder for governments? Because we were talking about public sector and I'm thinking about individuals and governments who have a mandate to be very particular about how how and where they spend their money. Um, and, and it may be difficult for folks in public sector organizations who are possibly even more constrained than private sector organizations. It may be difficult for them, for example, 
to spend time, pay time, contributing to a project that may not have be directly kind of a, a, have a direct link to their country organization, public sector organization. Um, and, and this is a long question. So that's my first thing is, is may, may that be the problem? And then I'm kind of already leaping to might inner source be a be a step on the way there. So if, if we can get folks in public sector, you know, getting at least used to, to contributing to someone else in the same public sector, you know, like umbrella, maybe in a different organization, maybe that's a first step to getting them used to contributing potentially outside their organization altogether. So that's a that's a yeah. lot of thoughts on that. Yeah, I I agree, and I, I I can understand the mindset that you 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 should be entirely focused on the delivery of the project that you have in front of you. It it, it makes sense, and that can cause challenges with respect to you know why should we contribute back to open source it, because it doesn't it, it it doesn't align with our immediate roadmap of release this project on date X. The, the, uh, there are various other angles you can use as well. I mean, I I would. I always try to go in with the positive angles and the positive benefits, but hey, you can play on fear and security and, uh, you know, you're consuming all this stuff. Do you really understand it? Is is it secure now? Is it secure for the long term? You can you can use a bit of fear as another motivator to to get people to at least consider aspects of, of contributing. Um, but I, I agree as well with, I think open source, sorry, inner source is a great stepping stone. I've seen that I've seen people using that technique long before it was even called inner source within financial services, because within financial services, the uh, there is there are some of the challenges you, you've described about, you know, justifying doing work other than work that contributes directly to your project. But in financial services, it's, it's more legal and compliance concerns that get in the way. And and if you an inner source models are, are much more. A, a desirable sort of stepping stone because you don't have the legal and compliance issues. The code still sits within within the walls of of your your investment bank or your large global institution. And, and I I do think inner source is a really really valuable stepping stone. And even if you don't step beyond inner source, it still has a lot of value to to organisations. I think also it's um, developers, engineers learn a lot from that style of collaboration i think there's there's a lot to be said about the cultural aspects just like um things like devops is a is a technical thing but it's also a bit more of a cultural concept open source is is a culture just as much as a technology and you do get a lot of the cultural benefits through moving to an inner source model Thank you. And, and, and Klaus, I'll bring you in here as well. So from your research in both inner source and open source, thinking about those motivations in terms of contributing versus just consuming, um, have you seen anything that, and, and in particular, something that, you know, works either in the private sector or the public sector, is there a difference, any any commentary on, on, on motivations in terms of that contribution side of things? Um, so uh, I, I think most most inner source programs that I've studied, they are with uh, with companies. I'm trying to think of were there any public sector, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, programs there. I, I I think most of it, and it's probably uh, for for any type of organization the same that uh, the difference between uh, consuming and producing or contributing is that people simply don't know or 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 the policies around it, uh, they are very much focused on, you know, uh, on on silo thinking. So people, they have to do what their manager tells them. If their managers, do, if they don't allow people to contribute, yeah, then it's a, then it's a lost game, I guess. So there needs to be, uh, and also just like uh, contributing back to open source, a lot of companies, they don't do that because they don't know how to. Right. They don't they don't have any idea how to do that. They might be willing, but they need to be tell, told basically how to like uh, and and like many large companies, like all, all the well-known companies that we can think of, like they do it. For example, OpenStack is a very large or uh, uh, community with uh, like over 200 companies, I believe. And like, there's a couple of companies are kind of competing at the, at the top, you know, who who can contribute most, and it almost becomes a game. But there's a lot of companies, 
uh, who who simply don't know where to start, and and that requires a lot of specific skills uh, to get into. So uh, if you tell your developers, you know, you should also contribute back, they have no, you know, if 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 nobody tells them how to do that, they have no idea, I guess. And and the same is true for inner source. You know, you can open it all up on your internal GitHub or GitLab or like whichever system you have. But that doesn't mean that people can now just start contributing. You know, that's you. You, you need to train people and tell people uh, both the receiver and the uh, and the sender, I guess, of, of contributions. Yeah, we 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 heard exactly that through a couple of the people that we interviewed who joined organizations as as a some sort of head of open source and and both of the people i recall talking to said yeah I, I joined the organization and then i hired a bunch of open source developers i said that sounds really weird that they they had developers yeah they didn't have the right kind of developers i needed to get some open source developers in to 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 create exactly. that cultural shift um i i could have spent ages trying to train them but it was easier for me to bring in the, the right kind of people and then then lead by example so i i think i think that brings us very nicely to a discussion about the skills that may be required to help everyone get uh move forward with the opportunities that are related to what you've described colin so um what i might say is i saw that there was another question just for everyone because i'm not sure everyone can see the questions and um, that come to the panel but there was another question in uh just specifically on whether or not the survey covered um the whether or not organizations did uh looking at uh, software composition analysis or software build materials and uh, just to note and maybe uh, Colin if you wouldn't mind sharing that link again in the in the in the chat just so everyone sees that and um, just to note that some of those specific areas I believe weren't covered it was focusing on the cultural aspects and um, but there is more information to be had from yeah. uh, the foundation cybersecurity area and there's also uh, Sonotype recently published a really good report I'll dig that one out so yeah we we were mostly cultural and high level viewpoint on open source rather than diving deep on on security because others others have done that and do it do it better to be honest great great thank you and and uh, uh yeah again i'm just not sure if folks in the can see the question so um again if you can stick your answers in the chat yeah. as well just to make sure that everyone sees them that would be that would be fantastic we'll do it. Um, and then if if it's okay with everyone, I would love to give a little overview of the survey and research that we did uh, here in Ireland, specifically on the skills agenda. So um, hopefully, Colin and Klaus, you'll stick around uh, so we can have a, a conversation afterwards. Cool. But I'm going to share my screen now. And let's, uh, whoops. Let's just put this in full screen. And I'm hoping everyone can see this now. So I get rid of all my chat windows. Forgive me. Now, so um, back uh, at, actually at the big, at the end of last year, um, Open Ireland Network uh, were invited to work together with um, a number of other organisations. Uh, in particular, Technology Ireland ICT Skillnet uh, were were commissioning this report on open source and inner source skills by working with Open Ireland Network uh, to to make that possible. And we're really we're really um, grateful for Technology Ireland ICT Skillnet support with the Open Ireland Network. Um, and thanks to everyone behind the scenes who helps make all these webinars and things like that happen there. Um, this is uh, the result of, of that report and survey that we did. Uh, again, just to clarify, this was mostly done with the community in Open Ireland Network, which is, an, um, you know, round about just under 200 uh, individuals who have come together to, uh, I suppose, try to promote open source in Ireland. So uh, it's probably not to be considered a general market uh, survey because most of the respondents did come from the community. So in that respect, it's a little bit biased, but what it does do is it gives us a really good insight into what is important for those people who are involved in the open source ecosystem in Ireland. And to kick off, uh, just to give you an overview about what Open Ireland Network is about, um, we came together in 2021 with the aims to connect the ecosystem in Ireland, knowing that although there were many different individual technical meetups and groups, we didn't have one place where everyone involved in the ecosystem could come and talk about those higher level issues. And we wanted to create an awareness and showcase some of the great work that's happening in Ireland that people didn't know that was happening actually in Ireland. So many of the 
amazing contributions in the open source community have come from people sitting in Ireland. They don't even know each other. So um, so we really wanted to help build awareness about that and showcase some of the work that's happening there and increase skills in general around this area, but also to remove any blockers that may be perceived to be in the ecosystem here. Um, for example, things like any procurement rules or anything like that that might be in place helping uh, organizations who work in this field get over those. And when we came together with uh, ICT Skillnet to actually look at the skills gap, <clears throat> we basically wanted to understand what that skills gap were. Every call we had, people would talk about the skills gap that's there, how hard it is to hire people. Um, but we wanted to get a little bit more detail about what do we mean when we say that. Um, and we also wanted to gather some input on how to address those skills gaps, because even how people learn and do uh, uh, learning and development in this ecosystem can sometimes be slightly different than perhaps other areas or functional areas. So we wanted to kind of examine that as well. From a methodology perspective, um, we did a phase of uh, discovery where we went out and looked at some of the industry reports and summarized that. Um, in collaboration with the community, we did a number of um, workshops where we created, co-created the survey with some of our community members uh, so that we gathered the questions that they felt were relevant for them. We published the survey, um, but then we followed it up with a number of interviews so that we could gather some um, more I suppose, uh, illuminating evidence and quant qualitative data that we could actually supply to actually make the evidence and, the, and the, the data more real. I will say that we learned a lot from other skill nets in terms of how they ran their research. And a big thank you to everyone that helped us um, with their previous learnings. And also to help thank again, those people who helped us with the design phase and indeed everyone who's helping us share the survey because a part of the reason we did this was to gain and grow awareness about this eco ecosystem system in Ireland. The audience was a mixture of large and small organizations, multinational and indigenous companies, folks from academia and community activists and members and advocates who run meetups and things like that in the community. Uh, we had representatives from all industries and the public sector. Um, from both the software and hardware companies, which was really interesting. Um, until we did this research, I hadn't been aware of so many uh, open hardware uh, organizations in Ireland. And again, some a lot of folks who were basing their business model in some respect on open source technology and um, that they would consider themselves commercial open source companies. So let's have a look at how we how we broke down the findings. First of all, we looked at those ecosystem trends. Then we looked at where and how the organization where where the organizations were interested and how they were investing in, in that area. We looked at the engineering skills they felt were important. And then also the non-engineering skills they felt were important. This was one of the surprising findings from the research. Um, to be honest, there was as much interest in the non-engineering skills as there were as there was in the engineering skills. And I think that's a, one of the key findings. And then also looked at the learning preferences. So we'll dive straight in. First of all, in terms of open source impact, um, we took this quote from a recent report from Red Hat, the State of Enterprise Support in 2022. I really like it because it builds on the well-known quote, the fact that software is eating the world. Um, but it says that enterprise open source software is doing most of the chewing, which, which I thought was great. Um, again, most people are not aware, but particularly outside the open source ecosystem, about how reliant the entire technology industry is on open source software. And it's one of the perceptions that has come up that we need to uh, get beyond the open source ecosystem to help leaders technical and executives that may not be technical at all, to help them understand how open source is underpinning most of the technology industry, but in fact, digital transformation across every industry. And so not only is it so prevalent in every piece of software available today, it's fundamental to a number of industries, um, but 93% of folks um, who are uh, surveyed with respect to open source skills say it's difficult to find the right type of talent, as Colin was uh, alluding to earlier. We also looked at inner source trends. Uh, despite the fact that there's some amazing research out there, uh, there isn't a lot of market data about inner source adoption at this point in time. Inner source commons do do a track of where organizations mention inner source publicly. And what you can see here is a sample of those organizations who have spoken publicly about their inner source journey. I can tell you from firsthand experience that we've seen a huge increase in the number of organizations and individuals coming to inner source commons looking to learn a little bit more about how to implement that method. 
and we encourage anyone else who wants to to come along too. But what I've included here are some of the motivations uh, for InnerSource that came out of the State of InnerSource survey that we completed in 2021, including removing silos, knowledge sharing, providing or creating reusable software, improved quality, developer speed, employee satisfaction, innovation and open source readiness. What you'll note actually is that many of these same types of benefits are also can be attributed to those organizations and individuals who are you know, engaging in open source contributions, um, but we see great parallels between the two. From a policy perspective, it is important to recognize, as again, Colin mentioned earlier in uh, the Europe wide study, that the European Commission is very much uh, pointing in the direction of open source as being uh, a, a key strategic direction for the European Commission as a whole. And this, this quote talks about the transformative, innovative and collaborative power of open source to allow for better European services and lowering costs to society. I will also note that the Open Forum Europe were involved in a, a study that actually looked at the economic impact. So not only does this provide savings and not only does it actually potentially provide better services to uh, European citizens, but it has a very definite economic impact. And that report that's available on the Open Forum Europe website um, talks about the fact that even an increase of 10% of contributions to open source software code in Europe annually would add an additional 0 0.4 to 0.6% increase in GDP and an additional 600 ICT startups in the EU. So there's a very direct correlation between increases in the provision and the contribution and the creation of open source software and the potential positive economic impact to all of our uh, economies. And here in Ireland itself, uh, we had in the report uh, a great quote from Barry Lowry, the Irish government CIO in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Um, and he was talking about basically how open source can provide better collaboration, stronger security and greater transparency. Interesting, that same transparency that Colin mentioned earlier, um, but also how Ireland can provide those benefits for Irish citizens uh, the Irish government can provide those benefits for Irish citizens, but also to be engaged in the global provision of digital public goods that can actually help uh, a pan society for all society and all Europeans, but much more broadly. And, and his interest in actually getting involved in initiatives such as GovStack, um, which is part of the UN's Digital Impact Alliance initiatives, um, to actually help share technology that is important for citizens worldwide. When we come to the actual survey results, uh, we found that unsurprisingly, 97% of those that answered the survey were engaged in open source and or and or inner source activities. Um, typically, they, the highest ranking activities they were engaged in was using open source tools or integrating open source software into products and services or ha having that open source software facilitate research and development. There was a actually relatively high number of folks collaborating with open source communities. Um, you know, in some respects, it's not talked a lot about how Ireland is contributing into the open source community. But when you look at figures, including, for example, GitHub contributions, um, you can actually see that the per capita contributions from Ireland are actually quite high relative to other European countries. And in this case, 44% of the respondents said that they were actually actively collaborating with open source communities. And 49% were using open source tools and practices such as InnerSource. So um, quite a high relative percentage uh, in terms of folks moving from just perhaps consuming open source to also contributing to it. The top reasons to use open source and inner source uh, were listed as faster time to market, reducing cost, more innovation, growing skills and access and talent. Um, and that was something that also came out in the discussions and in the interviews that the, the participation in open source communities not only gives that value that we heard about earlier, whereby you actually get a seat at the table, can um, perhaps address any security issues that come up, but can um, help shape future directions. But it also links you with the people who are the talent who are helping make that happen across the world. And so individuals and organizations who get involved in open source communities have often a better access to talent uh, globally than perhaps folks that perhaps sit a little bit more passively and don't engage in that community. From a professionalization of open source perspective, 
Only 12% said that they engaged in a personal capacity only, which suggests that the vast majority of people who participated in the survey um, see the engagement with open source as being a part of their professional lives. So this is uh, something that they are paid to do. We see that 54% reported having formal policies governing use and contributions. And 52% had formal awareness programs around open source or inner source. So they were running formal programs within their organization. 38% had an OSPO in place, uh, which was presumably helping build those policies and run those awareness programs. When it looks at engineering skills, and again, this is just a snapshot of what, what has been included in the report. I really would encourage you to look at the full report uh, to get more details. But the types of skills that were listed were using open source uh, tools to develop both software and hardware, uh, deploying open source software and hardware, how to do that effectively. Collaborative coding skills came up as both a topic in the quantitative research, but also in the surveys as being so important. Um, and, and it speaks to what was just discussed in our in our chat earlier, the notion that many of, for example, uh, our corporate developers or computer science graduates may be very skilled in very particular technical areas, but they may not have had experience in actually doing collaborative coding, in particularly in, in the open source community, and may not be um, may not know the culture and the norms and the processes that they should follow in order to be effective in that environment. Uh, another area was integrating open source software and hardware, and another area was open source development practices and practices like inner source. So these were all listed as areas that these organizations felt were incredibly important in the coming years as they hire for technical roles. More Oh, and also we did ask about which projects people were interested in, in learning. And of course, the, the thing with the open source community is that there are so many different projects that, uh, that were important. Um, we, we have listed a sample of those in the report, uh, but many of the topics that were covered are perhaps uh, more general and would cover many of these particular types of technology projects. From the non-engineering skills perspective, and this is where I personally think it got really, really interesting, it was very clear that there was a need for more people who have a, a greater awareness of the licensing and compliance um, challenges and opportunities around open source, um, that the open source business and IP skills were lacking in Ireland. So folks that knew about how to do commercial open source business um, and the implications of IP in this ecosystem and a great awareness of, of what that means uh, was something that people were looking for. General open source policies and procedures, uh, there, was a, there was a gap in terms of skills there. Very interestingly, and this came from a number of organizations, um, the idea that people in sales and marketing would have a really good understanding of open source, its use, um, its value, and how to explain that to potential customers. That was something that was seen to be a huge gap, and particularly for folks that were in that commercial open source uh, area. Um, and, and one area that I think is, is we have a great potential to, to build on in Ireland. And then the area of ethics, social and sustainability skills are all seen to be very closely related to the open source ecosystem and understanding the implications or the, the again, challenges and opportunities that present um, themselves in relation to open source development was seen to be an important set of skills. When we look at learning preferences, what was really clear was that maybe unlike some other technical skills or even non-technical skills, um, this was not something that could just be book learned. Um, and, and so almost all of the, of the folks that responded was talking about the idea that practical experience, for example, contributing to an open source community was incredibly essential in terms of actually building these skills. The community and mentors probably play an even bigger part in open source development skills. Um, than, than they might in, in other areas. Um, so this idea of mentorship and community that is so critical to the open source community itself is also critical, unsurprisingly, in actually building the skills in this area. Um, the idea that, that 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 facilitates learning or that we allow to facilitate learning um, would be, I suppose this would be just in terms of how the organizations facilitate those learnings and facilitated practical experiences. So this was more than just letting people loose in communities to go out and gain experience, but maybe a curated path that people might be able to 
be provided to help them understand and make that a safe experience for them. The other the other piece of feedback was that the ask for more flexible courses and accreditation. So whereas, you know, the options of having something formal was was, you know, well, well perceived and well received. The idea that there may be more flexible options was also an important aspect. And the biggest blocker to learning was identified as time available to learn. So I'm not sure this is any different than any other learning and development um, challenge out there. But uh, it is worthwhile noting that those uh, people who I suppose are more successful with learning have dedicated time to do that within their work life. The recommendations that came out of the report, uh, we had five distinct recommendations. One was that we would create a directory of resources because there was it was noted that perhaps some people, although they want to grow some of these skills, there may be courses or learning materials out there, but they find it hard to find. So that is something that we're, we're definitely interested in looking at. Um, there was a notion that we should actually create some new learning to fill some of these areas that perhaps are not well covered by the ecosystem. Um, and I would point to those areas of non-engineering skills, which personally I feel are perhaps less well covered in the ecosystem. And there may be an opportunity to create new learning in that respect. It was noted that we could look at the idea of extending the existing portfolio of skill net learning and resources. Um, and so that rather than creating something just for people interested in open source, that perhaps we had the opportunity to create things that were more horizontal learnings that could go into some of the other strategic areas that SkillNet looked like. For example, um, the Cyber Ireland or cybersecurity community, uh, there's obviously a huge tie in between having good practices with open source consumption and your cybersecurity policies. And so perhaps there are opportunities for us to collaborate on something in that area. It was also noted that we should support the creation of open source program offices or OSPOs, particularly in universities, to help with the um, creation, curation, um, education, awareness within these institutions, um, and that they too would provide a, a focal point or an area where other OSPOs or other institutions could also interact and engage with them. And the last recommendation was that this is only the start of this conversation and that perhaps we need to continue exploring this area and looking at what we can do here in Ireland um, for Irish companies and for Irish individuals or folks based in Ireland, um, but also anyone else who may be interacting uh, with that global community. What can we do here locally that can um, help the broader community? I just want to say, finally, before um, I finish up here, just a huge thank you to um, my co-author, Klaus, who's with us here today, but all the contributors, both the partner organizations who helped us in, in pulling together the information, and then all the individuals who helped us in terms of actually co-creating the content, and indeed um, the 18 individuals who were interviewed as part of the um, deeper dive into the information. And I would encourage you all to have a look at the, the survey um, and the report that's available on openirelandnetwork.com um, and to get more detail about all of those uh, great individuals. So that is the end of the presentation. Just to say, um, we would really like you to sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already. Join us on LinkedIn. And oh, next event, Wednesday 23rd. I, I actually gave this presentation as a dry run yesterday. <laughs> so that's obviously today. <laughs> But uh, we do hope that you will come back uh, to our next event that I know we're already planning for the new year um, uh, to hear more in this area. Um, but thank you, everyone. And I'm going to stop share now. And I am going to check and see if, um, well, first of all, if there are any comments in the in the comment in the question area. Um, oh, there is. So, there so, is. There's a very, so there's a very good question by uh, Jeffrey Rowe. Thank you. Uh, about uh, safety, and I, I presume that, and uh, so the, the question basically is: How can we uh, make sure that staff or the, the employees are, you know, how to keep them safe when engaging with these communities outside of work? And I think uh, what he means by outside of work is like probably not outside work hours, because this is, I guess, the expectation is is that you would engage with open source communities within the work hours because you do it on behalf of the company uh, but that you go out there and engage with an external community with people that might be rather potentially unpleasant to deal with for example so the, like the linux kernel mailing list is is notorious for its rather rough uh, kind of style of you know engagement uh rules and and more and more communities they have uh 
uh, codes of conduct, I guess, but uh, it's certainly not not very uh, well. It's not certainly a uh, a given, I guess. So it's a really good uh, question. I don't think we have any information about this. Uh, but what what are your experiences, uh, Colin or Claire? Hi, uh, Colin. I think you're on mute there, perhaps. Oh yes, there we go. I got mute on the headset. Rather than anyway. headset. <laughs> um, I, I guess without getting into the specifics, this this further sort of reinforces the need for maybe not an open source program office, but you do need to have someone who has a, a broad understanding of all of the challenges because some of them are subtle, and and I wouldn't want fear to get in the way either. A lot of open source communities are incredibly welcoming, and also. I wouldn't want to take away the sort of learning experience. People have to be able to understand how to engage with these communities. Yes, they're they're your employees. You should you have a you have a responsibility to provide a, a safe working environment. But at the same time, you need to equip them with the skills needed to be able to engage with open source and then get the help from it from their employer should they need it. In, in my opinion. Because again, most of these communities are are welcoming places. And again, I'll, I'll refer to other reports that there there are diversity challenges within open source. The, the IT industry has a yeah. has a diversity challenge in general. With open source, it's only more acute. So I'm not saying there aren't issues, but at the same time, I don't think we should have a fear that it's all hostile. I, and I would add in that, you know, I think it's something that perhaps isn't explicitly mentioned in, say, for example, I mean, you, you've both mentioned that idea of the OSPOs as, as, as the open source program office as being a place that could support that. And I think, you know, I've certainly heard some best practices that do relate to the idea that if if a, an employee has an issue, that it shouldn't be on them to, re, to help resolve it or, or to bring up a code of conduct or to, you know, report a, a, a breach of code of conduct or anything like that. But sometimes it does really help to have that kind of backup from from your organization to say well i'll do that for you 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 don't yeah, have to yeah. go down that path and have those difficult conversations with people but 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 to be honest the project should know like if, if they if they are in some way being um or having some sort of uh um inappropriate engagements and um, then that's not good for the health of the project so so in many respects there is in, in the same way as there is a, um, it behooves us all to, to contribute to open source. It, it, it makes it, we, we should all be trying to make it a better, more welcoming place as well. Yep. Yeah. I guess. And, uh, so I have accepted that, that. Well, so I, so I, I was just going to say that, uh, so the example that was given was, uh, you know, that, that some communities, they might not have, uh, they might not be gentle in code reviews, for example. Um, and so there is some research on uh, code reviews and and how to best, uh, you know, uh, how to best conduct code reviews or how to best engage with code reviews uh, as an external uh, contributor. So th th there's a considerable amount of research being done at the moment, or in the, in a, certainly in the past few years, on uh, company engagement with with open source communities and and how people contribute to open source communities. And you know the uh, the engage like the way that people engage with with one another, I guess. And you know there's certainly also the diversity angle. So you know there's some research, for example, that uh, that suggests that you know uh, contributors who are uh, who are probably female or have a female sounding name. They can be, you know, critiqued more harshly, for example, in in the in the code reviews, and so there's all sorts of uh, interesting research on this topic, and also some, I guess, guidance on how to best approach this. Yeah, yeah I'd, 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 I'd hope I'd hope that a, a, a very mature open source program office would, if they were having an experience where an open source maintainer was hostile or 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 upsetting an employee, I'd hope an OSPO would engage with them and educate them. I, I think it's, it, yes, protect your employees, that, that should be your first in priority. But if you're finding hostile, finding a hostile environment, help the community to be better. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 mm-hmm. another thing I would note is that um, uh, more recently, I've also been been made aware. And I, I think there's there's so much to learn from other disciplines. Like so there, there probably are best practice guides in terms of the process by which a formal, very effective uh, code review could be done. But that whole area of nonviolent communication and how to do, you know, positive communication and collaboration is an entire field within the psychology you know, departments. And I do think there's probably a lot that we could learn there as well. Um, things that may feel like, oh, you know, are we getting into just like, you know, kumbaya land? But actually, there's so much that actually our best practices in terms of how to form, how to use language in a way that becomes non-combative, that that takes away that adversarial perspective. And sometimes it's just the language we use. Um, so, uh, so I just, you know, want to point out that that's obviously an area that we could explore in the future. Um, and and not to mind the bit of the crossover, I see again, Rakesh, thank you for your for your um for your comments and questions. Uh, there's a huge amount of overlap between the open source policies and procedures that people need to know about and just the other disciplines that are happening as well within within organizations. Um, one is the obviously the cyber area. I would say I, I was I was at a, a, a presentation recently around the sustainability and what's coming down the line in terms of organizations being asked to explore perhaps the um, energy efficiency of the code they create and things like that. And I'm thinking there's so much in the open source area of tools that can help that kind of, you know, work happen. um, That I think that there's huge uh, um, opportunities for collaboration in the future in that area too. So, um, so yes. So, so I, I think in general, we we can all agree that, um, that from, from a skills perspective, um, I'd be interested to hear uh, both Colin and Klaus, your own perspectives around this idea of the non-engineering skills, because for me, that was the biggest surprise. The emphasis that everyone put on that for me was that I didn't expect that going into this this um, this process at all. Uh, and I just it, it struck me like real hard and fast, like because there's an, an acknowledged gap from a technical perspective. But it seems like there is an unacknowledged, even bigger gap in the non-engineering side of things. And I just think that that's extraordinary that it's not necessarily being talked about more. And having said that, at the same time, it shouldn't really surprise us. Uh, Books that go back as far as 1978 or 79 or something around that, you know, uh, books like People Wear by Tom DeMarco um, and and Tim Lister, you know, in the early days of computing and and automation, uh, it was, it was always a conclusion that it wasn't actually the technology that was problematic. It is always the the people issues, the gap between management and developers, for example, um, the ability to write requirements. And I, I know that this is a different world and we don't have any, you know, structural requirements documents anymore, mostly, you know, that there's some waterfall uh, a domain still alive, I guess, but but mostly it's about working together, collaboration and communication. And the, te- the technology is usually not the problem. The, the technology can be solved. It is mostly about everything else around it. The kind of the, the invisible stuff or the, the things that we are unaware of. I completely agree with that. And uh, I've, I've been working in software for around about 20 years and I've seen projects fail. And I cannot think of a single project where it fails because of the technology. It's always because we built the wrong thing. There was a communication issue that it's the mm. people aspect that, that gets in the way for sure. So I must yeah. admit, I'm not at all surprised that it's it's <clears throat> not the engineering skills. It's the soft skills, the communication skills. But again, that's why I think um, having experience in in working in open source is tremendously valuable uh, mm-hmm. and it's skills that are equally applicable to to the work that you do within the company that you work in you know it, you those are highly transferable and and one of, if, if you can do it with people who have no commercial interest in helping you like if you it, i always think yeah. that if you, if you succeed in those kind of collaborative communities you can succeed doing anything like that's that's yeah. literally the highest level of leadership skills like being able to facilitate or influence change through others where they're where you're not paying them and you can't force them to do anything you know <laughs> yeah that's a very good point point. and i guess um 
it was interesting in your survey when you were to, in in your presentation when you were talking about the, the challenges of acquiring these skills they're not the types of skill that you can typically pick up through reading a book there's a certain element of experience uh, required and I'll, I'll let you know what we're doing at scott logic so we've got around about 350 software engineers at scott logic and i would love to get to the point where every single one of those engineers has committed code to an open source project and that's kind of a personal goal of mine and i've been starting with um, some of our more junior folk we, when we have graduates coming in in the near future we're going to be uh, putting them through a process that sounds more painful than it should we're going to be supporting them in their first small steps in open source we've, i've already done it with a small group of people where we've been looking at good first issues, other easy routes into open source. And we've been putting uh, a support network around them to help them pick up those skills. And I, I'm hoping that within Scott Logic, we can create a, a, a network effect and, and get to the point where everyone has those open source skills. Well, I think I would look forward to hearing more about that, uh, Colin, because I think those kind of patterns of learning and development are things that we do need to um, give more details about. Sometimes sometimes you feel that everyone's doing this from first principles and, and hearing hearing about people's experiences with those kind of programs, I think, really helps give people the confidence to roll out something similar. So we would love to hear more about that in the future. Um, I, I will also say, just because it came up about the security thing, um, that that we, we, we think that the next uh, community call on this in January is likely to be on the topic of security um, and the idea of S-bombs and how you can do that and open chain and all that sort of thing. So um, I was already just talking to someone uh, who's going to be joining us, uh, details to be announced soon in January to helpfully go over those topics. So I just also want to give a nod to, to make sure to keep an eye out for that as well. <laughs> Um, so if there are any other questions then that I would I would I would ask the last chance to to kind of ask the panel a question. But if not, what we might do is finish up a few minutes early, get, let everyone get to their dinners if they're in the Irish time zone. Hopefully they are. Um, and uh, and, <laughs> and I, I just want to say a huge thank you um, to our uh, other speakers here today. Thank you so much, Colin, for joining us. We loved your presentation. Thank you, Klaus, for not only today, but all your um, amazing con collaboration on the report over the last number of months. So really, really appreciate that too. Um, and I want to thank everyone who could join us here today. And in fact, everyone who can see this after the fact. Um, but we, we, we're delighted that you're part of the Open Ireland Network. And please share this widely because we'd like to get more people involved. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to say have a good Wednesday. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.